Name one entrepreneur that is exactly the same as the next next one. Is Elon Musk the same as Steve Jobs? The whole thing is they're all outliers in their own way. And the thing that makes them really strong is being outliers. And the thing that makes them crazy or strong, right? It's a fine line. Um, and then bringing a team around that can soften your hard edges and so something. We all have incredible skill sets that we can make better and better and better if we if we take them. The point is, if you're like everybody else, you're average. If you read what everybody else do does, you'll see the same same, same things. Um, stepping outside of that is, and we're talking a lot about it, is accountability. What do I want my life to look like? Today, I'm sitting down with Jeff Booth. Jeff is an entrepreneur, technology leader, and the author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is Key to an Abundant Future. Jeff was the co-founder and the CEO of Build Direct, which he led for nearly 20 years through the dot-com crash and through the 2008 financial crisis and many waves of technological disruption. In Jeff's book, The Price of Tomorrow, he provides great historical context, financial policies that have led us to the current state of the economy, and he provides great insight into how we may be able to enable a brighter future for our children. Jeff has been featured in Forbes, TechCrunch, Inc.com, Fast Company, Entrepreneur, Bloomberg, Time, and The Wall Street Journal. In 2016, Goldman Sachs named Jeff among its top 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs. Jeff is also a founding partner of Odeo Labs, the co-founder of AddyInvest.com and Knock Knock, and serves on several boards and advisory boards. I truly enjoyed my conversation with Jeff today, and I believe you will too. So with that said, let's dive in with Jeff Booth. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you like and comment below. And to find future episodes in your feed and push notifications, make sure you subscribe. And if you click the little bell, you'll get every new episode as it's released. Thanks again for watching. Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Jake. Okay, glad to be here. Um, so you know I bring people on the show that I consider to be docents, and I do think you are a docent. So, but I, before we get into the questions, I want to ask you, who are your top five in your life? Who are the five people you're surrounding yourself with the most these days outside of your immediate family? I, uh, friends, I would say. I, I would say. So, and, and that's a tricky question for me, but it, I think it leads to what, you're, what, what you want to go to. People, I think people look up to certain people and they follow those, uh, uh, those, those people. Um, and they say, those are the people I want to follow. At, at, and, and they miss some of the negatives in those people too, because they don't know them very well. They mm -hmm. don't know how they act very well. And, and so I tend to not do that. I tend to learn from everyone. Um, so I, I really feel like I can learn. I, I don't have to look upwards to learn. I can look downwards to learn as well. And so I don't think about social hierarchy or anything else. I, I, I literally try to learn from everybody I meet. I like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I say is that you are the average of the people you surround yourself with. So that's why I kind of asked that question. And, um, that changes all the time too, right? Depending on the year and the decade and it's just constantly evolving and changing on who we surround ourselves with that kind of shapes and forms yeah. our opinions. And, and I and I say and, and I say that that uh, and, and I, I'm sure we'll get into this uh, uh, later. But if you looked at the abundance of in my life of around friends and like super deep relationships, um, you would you would be blown away. Like you, it's it's just not something that looks normal, and that's what I'm proud of. Uh, that's what I'm most proud of. And it looks that way because I've constructed my life that way. Um, and I know that I know all the literature on. Who do you hang around? Who are the yeah. top five people that you hang around? Or I know that, and, and that's supposed to okay. You, you, now you can get more wealth and everything else because you're hanging around with those people. I don't think about it that way at all. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about you, Jeff, is that you also say you read 50 books a year. So it's okay if you surround yourself with people that have different views because you're constantly getting a different perspective on the world. So that's actually exactly so. Those two things together yeah. allow you to de detach following a certain small number of people that's right it gives you mental mental models that are, are that are way broader yeah which if more people read more that'd probably be great but most people don't read as much as you are so they probably want to change their worldview by maybe experiencing different things somehow or but no let's move i want to go back to your childhood so tell us about your early years your childhood where you grew up with socio socioeconomic kind of background what did your parents do for a living if you could just kind of get a little purview into who jeff was as a child one thing I would, I would say is anytime somebody's doing this 
um, including me. I'm doing it from my viewpoint, it's a true. small child growing up, and you and and in in your own certain things, um, certain things hit for you that you might not even know. You you make a big deal out of them that that other people wouldn't have made a big deal. Exactly. Out of them. So but so, so again, it's my view. Uh, born in uh, some of my view, some of its facts. Yeah, I was like you were Regina. born as a fact. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, born in Regina, um, moved to uh, moved out to Vancouver when we were young, or when I was uh, when I was really young. Um, two uh, two brothers. Um, my parents. First, my dad. Uh, I, I was an auto sales manager of a, an auto dealership. Mom stayed home when we got to be. I think about and when I got to be eight years old, um, my mom went into real estate. This was 1978, 79, went into real estate. My dad, because of the opportunity to spend more time with family, uh, my dad followed uh, her into real estate. So they were both in, uh, in real estate. Um, I wouldn't say in social economic, um, what it felt like, what it probably was, what it felt like is we were the wealthiest family around because you didn't, you didn't care about that because you had all your friends and everything else. What it probably really looked like is we worked, right? But I think we, that was hidden from us. Yeah. And then in, 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 in 1980, 81, my parents did extraordinarily well in real estate. Um, there was a, a, a obviously a massive rise. That's before interest rates went to 20 odd percent. Yeah. Um, they had... They had real estate everywhere, servicing loans everywhere and everything else. And then in 81, have both your parents in real estate, real estate market crashes, nothing services itself anymore. And, and, and again, these are things you don't know as an 11 year old kid. Um, you just know the tension that it creates yes, at home. I felt that in 1990 right. recession. Yep. Yeah. And, and so, so I think through that tension at that time, wired in my brain uh what was i'm never going to let this happen to my family i'm going to make so much money you like me that's what i thought i'm never going to let this and it wasn't their family. fault they were victims of circumstances no no no, no. Which we'll get into. again that's actually why that's i say right. yep. it, that's why i say it's, it's all perception it's your own relationship with yeah. it and yep. everything else and then but my my parents are still together today they, yeah mine too they, they didn't bother them so much right? they, like, exactly fantastic relationship everything else yep. and 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 created all of this abundance everywhere else that's right so again but it was my reaction with it and so uh so so um and so i had i'm gonna make so much money it's not gonna matter i'm gonna have moats around my castles <laughs> and everything else and uh the alternative is money doesn't matter at all and so those two competing things, I would I can say, never get to the alternative. <laughs> but but, but it, funny enough, I have. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, and so we'll get so we'll get in uh, we'll get into that, I'm sure. But um, and and so then through school, I did uh, I did very well in school. I was uh, I, I was put in enriched classes and everything else. That uh, but but actually, I hated that part of it because I was an outlier in the same school. Um, so I wanted to be with my friends. I was labeled be, go through school, like, okay, you're the smart kid and everything else. That's not a really great spot no. to be when yeah. you're, uh, my 16, cousin was so like that. He's a surgeon now, but he, we all made fun of him for being smart. <laughs> it's like, how stupid were we? Not only were we stupid, we were really stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I rebelled against that. Uh, I, um, and, and, and so learned a lot about myself in that. And actually what we touched on before. Uh, one of my big, biggest learnings out, out of that is, uh, and, and this happened in grade 11, I, I was an asshole. I was like, I was, uh, I was trying to find myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I turned on different friends because I wanted to, I turned on the smart friends because I wanted to be uh, part of the cool crowd and everything else. And I realized, uh, and I realized through that experience, I will never do that again. I'm going to be me all the time. Yep. And, and, and what was there all along, like, so it, at that age, you're trying to fit in, you're trying to find other people who fit in and everything else. And everybody's chasing what they think looks great from somebody else's perspective. That changed me completely. And, and I said, I'm just going to be me a hundred percent. And the, and it was like a light switch. The world uh, changed as well. Now I probably couldn't have got that if I didn't have such a strong family upbringing, everything else social, but, but, the abundance that came from their friends, like, so what I realized in grade 12 was 
every single other person is looking for that same thing. And when you're that person, it just, it, 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 it attracts to you. Um, so that was a really, uh, that was a learning experience, a big learning experience for me. And then I went into, I went into university because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and then I dropped out of university. I went into real estate and I, I, I did really in short order. I did really well in real estate. Then I bought a real estate company. That was a terrible investment, everything else. Cause you have to manage other realtors. Oh um, and then, uh, um, and then, um, through that experience, I, I, I started a building company, uh, uh, did very well at the building company. Then I, uh, then started, uh, build direct, um, which you, you mentioned in the yes. show opening. In your book, you said that, <clears throat> which you just said again, you had amazing parents and brothers, and they taught you right from wrong, they supported you, and they constantly challenged your learning through rigorous debate, which allow you to see a different world than most people see and build on the edge of that knowledge. I really like that, by the way. By the way, the book is great. Everybody's got to read this book. It's a fantastic book. Um, you also Thanks, said, Jeff, Jeff that uh, you didn't grow up wealthy like we just talked about, and that you had adversity growing up. I found that there's some kind of trauma a lot of times with entrepreneurs in early years. And like to your point, it's just in our own head, maybe <laughs> we may have another yeah. way, no matter what, right? You said you experienced tremendous loss, the kind when it feels like everything is taken in an instant. What were you talking about there? Um, I lost uh, one, uh, one of my brother's best friend, lost okay. my brother. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, and that, that's obviously a, a big tra uh, trauma. The, uh, Build Direct itself. I, I built twenty years through everything. At one point, my own personal wealth in that company was a hundred million dollars. Um, but it was way more than a hundred million dollars. It's what it stood for: Fre friends, family. That just this ride that was so. It was so much fun, actually. So a lot of people worried about that. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. But uh, um, not not a, not at all. But a lot of people. That's kind of a, because. You you know a bunch of other founders and everything yep. else, and they get so caught up into the belief the system CEO and the company, blah, blah, blah. Company, rather than they I'm this person. <laughs> exactly, exactly, they right. can't see past that, and then they then they get reinforced that by you said Goldman Sachs mentions me top hundred yep. entrepreneurs, and, and you want to keep doing those things, or some people want to keep doing those things for the outward attention. Yeah, right. So they keep on they they're caught in a loop. They don't see it. So, um, but from a wealth, from a family, from all my friend, a bunch of my friends that invested in the company. Um, I cared a lot about the people in my cap table for that to, uh, for that to essentially be recapitalized for, and, and, and it, and it was recapitalized because I made a tactical mistake. Uh, I, I, by the way, I like that you're saying that because so many people don't do what you're about to say, which taking some accountability for the failure, even though it wasn't fully your part, you're like, I like that people do that. You know, I do that a lot too. Yeah. I say, I gave, I gave them the opportunity to, to do what they did. You know, yeah. it is what it is. I, I got to own it. You know, you, you can't look at be a victim. Being a victim doesn't help. Let's dig into that because it's a really important piece to, uh, to, but first, so in that, in that piece, I brought in a friend to, uh, as, as, uh, uh, with, with debt. And normally I wouldn't do that. Normally I would, uh, I would have taken equity yeah. because of the risk of debt and everything else, but I misjudged because it was a friend and I didn't even, I didn't do it with a, open market or anything else. I, it was, it were, they were good terms. It was a friend and, and, and said, and he said, listen, this is something that's so great. I want to build this with you. And we were through what happens in business is sometimes you have to change the business and you have to, yeah. it's almost look pivot. like you have to pivot. Um, <clears throat> that's easy to do or not easy to do, but people talk about doing that at 10 people, 20 people, 50 people. And I'd done that a number of times and had massive growth on the back side of that, that pivot because you're doing the right thing. When you're doing that pivot with 350 people and 100, 130 million need a lot US of revenue, you, growing, growing at 40 or 50% a year, but you have to still make the pivot. It. Um, it's way harder. The the I underestimated how hard that is, and I underestimated that not that we weren't right, underestimate, but underestimated the capital that it would take because essentially you have to ask your entire team who's doing one job to say to believe in another job, and then go back to do the desk to do the other the job they're doing while they're waiting for the new job to be able to right. happen. So it's a really, it's- You're like, this is obsolete, we know it. But let's try to work on this. And then they're thinking, well, if this new thing doesn't work out, you're saying this is dying anyway? <laughs> Even though it's growing, right? You, it's the growth rate is the problem. And in that 
in that thing, you'll see why it's so hard for existing companies, existing fr- structures to change because the, the inertia from their existing business yep. keeps them from changing. That's right. So I really understand that, uh, that, that at a level that took my business. So I <laughs> really understand it. And, um, and so it's not bad people in an existing system. It's just the inertia of a system yep. all doing a different job. So, but, but that that business. So when I walked away from that business, because essentially that friend uh, came to me and said, I, I, I want to own it with just you. And what that would mean to me is so recap the company and, and, and he wanted to give me a bunch more ownership in the company than I had. But what that would mean for me is turning my back on everybody else who believed in me and, and friends, everything else. And I couldn't do it. So I walked away. I walked away knowing that that ca- company was going to be recapped and my ownership would go to zero. I walked away with zero after 20 years in the business and, but, but, and selling my home to be into the business oh. and everything else and my, my, my house, not knowing how I'd pay rent at the end of the month. Um, and, and so, so yeah, I know all of these at a person, what it looks like, but, but again, I walked to it when, when you think you have nothing zero and you have everything, you have everything you could ever want at zero. Yeah. It's a pretty powerful, pretty powerful spot to be. And, and again, what, what happened on the backside of that, if that was the end of the story, it might've looked bad, but it, it actually seriously looked like if anyone's watched the movie, it's a wonderful life. It looked like the movie, it's a wonderful life. And, and what's happened on the backside of that, that's been so incredible. You say something about this in a book too, about when you walked away, I think, but you know, you still have your values or something like that. And, and we talked about it before the, the pre uh, interview, we talked about it, but I, I, I respect the fact that you did that. And I had a similar kind of situation with my company. Um, I want to ask you a question. In the book, you said that you wanted to be wealthy at an early age, like 12. Is this related to the financial kind of perception that you had of your parents' situation? Is that what you were talking about there? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, it, so it's, it's out of, it, it, it's out of at that time, fear of loss and what money can do to you. If you don't have anything and you're scraping by and you're in, in that fear or that, that, that fear that that puts a family into, I never wanted to uh, go through that again. I didn't want to put anybody through that. So I wanted to overcome that. So again, a lot of people have that. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, from any sort of, if you see many times immigrants coming to the U S create incredible businesses because, because of that, the question isn't that isn't that it's, does that take you? And the entire thing becomes about the the money and everything else, and you lose why you're do- you, you lose how you're the money's supposed to doing- provide freedom. Once you have your freedom, you really don't need any more of it, right? Amen. Like, yeah, Amen. that's it's, it's just a it's a lever, it's a tool, and uh, sometimes yeah. we just we get addicted to the chase rather than the end goal that you've received. And Jay, you asked this other as we were talking about the build direct and everything else. You, you talked about accountability. Yep. I used to think that that it was that it was reading that provided um the in, or the or learning that provided the growth opportunities and actually if i if i really did and it wasn't until on a podcast not that long ago that i actually realized it actually wasn't that that drove the learning it was the accountability that drove the desire to learn and and you could look at every single situation and and our ego protects us from seeing the truth and when you said um and so, so when you see the victim said, said the victim, when you say it's somebody else's fault, it, it then you don't have to change. <laughs> and, 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 and so it, it allows you to stay uh, in a, a status quo. Yep. When you take accountability for every single thing in your life, and it's just a mirror image of your life, then you, it forces you to cha- change and do the things you need to do. So it's actually the accountability first that drives the learning. I believe, it's interesting. Um, or at least, at least, in, at least in me. But, but again, you could think about this that that part of the victim because the same thing is to the person who's chasing money and everything else. Why is that victim a victim? Why do they want to be? Why do they want to be a victim? Because I don't think they want to be a victim. But well, they don't want to be. But they also don't want to. They don't want to say it's be my fault. Then I have to change. I have to be. It's too introspective. People don't do that. So here's what I think happens at a at a at a, at a level. I think the higher order thing in all of our lives is we want love and belonging mm-hmm. and, and the victim gets love and belonging by being a victim. And so, so, th- but they've lost the, 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 why they do it 
for, for the thing that gets them love and belonging. And then as they're pushing away with all of their might, everything in their life or, or love and belonging in their life, because nobody can handle it anymore. What do they do? They go deeper into the rat hole, right? So they do more drama. And, and again, the entire time, they think it's other people. They think it's other people. Yeah, they don't see it. And so right. they, do, they don't see it. Yeah. So they do more things to bring in love and belonging because it worked in the beginning that uh, that drive them further down, down that Surround that, themselves that with an echo chamber. Around. Surround themselves. Yep. Exactly. Um, and, and everybody else sees it. Yeah. But they don't see it. So why, how is that any different than the multi-billionaire um, that doesn't need any more money that is doing the <laughs> exact same thing for love and belonging and put and often pushing everything away. Yeah. The only problem and the difference is that the people around him are financially incentivized by him to shut up. <laughs> so it's a little different for the normal person. They should just be nice and say, listen, you got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but again, but again, those things, why, why, why I like to actually pick out those things. If they're in the victim, if they're in, by the way, I know lots of billionaires there. It's in the billionaire too. It's in, if this thing is in all of us, then we all chase the same thing. Then it has to be in me too. Yeah. It's innate in our DNA. Yep. It's, it's in, in, and, and maybe the reason I'm doing uh, this podcast or doing a bunch of podcasts is ultimately for it, it. It feels good because when people say your stuff really matters to me and changes <laughs> right. lives to you, but, but again, it's a drug. I, I actually think you should be doing these podcast interviews because I think your book needs to get out there so that Elizabeth Warren can <laughs> so, read it. <laughs> again, so, so that that I agree with that, but that's actually why that's actually why I could tell myself that I have to do it. I have to be the one that changes the world. That's right. But why do I uh, uh, right? So all the all these things are are construct. I don't have to do any of that. I have of to make sure that uh, that that um and but I have to watch that in my own ego. Yeah. And, and and why I say why I try to use examples for myself is because then if I can do it, other people can start to see the things in them that are holding them back. Because uh, because what I can tell you is it, it, it that accountability, if you can t if you can look in the mirror and say it's all me, changes your life. That's great. I really like that. Um, my next part that I was going to go over, but I think you just already covered it, is affirmation and approval. As I always ask people about this, like, do you, do you, or did you seek affirmation and approval from others, like your parents? Or, but you, you being honest, you're an honest person. Like, we all do that, right? That's what we do. To what extent do we do and, that? You know. And and what I said is in grade eleven, I did like in a big in a, and 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 I and I lost me in that process. Yeah. I, I lost myself in that process, and I realized, wait, why do we do that? We do that out of love and belonging. And so I'm going to do it a totally different way. And I'm going to just be really honest with myself on that. And, and where can I change? What, what things, when, when, something's, uh, when something's happening to you, uh, you in the world, if the victim doesn't see it and, you, and, and, and they think their whole world looks like this, then where in my world might I look like the victim? If, if, I, if I don't have incredible friendships, if I don't have incredible wealth, if I don't have incredible everything else, it's not everybody else, it's me. And so where in that, and, I, and I'm really <laughs> methodical in that, what are, uh, um, what are the places that I need to change? I'm, I'm gonna bore the audience maybe, I don't know. I'm gonna read a few things that I had in your book. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good stuff. Okay. So, <laughs> just, so I'm gonna read a couple of these and then we're gonna ask, I'm gonna talk about it. So in the book you wrote, the opportunity to create something better comes from observing something broken or doesn't work the way you believe it should. Just a great way to kind of understand the mindset of the founders who create things in the world that are amazing technologies, the Elons of the world, right? I really like that. I've always said that I think that pattern recognition and self-awareness are a critical key to your success. And it's what you've been talking about through the interview so yeah. far. Um, this is my notes here. So it's like, I don't know if it's that you kind of, uh, you know, pushed that through when I was reading your book yesterday <laughs> in some way. Um, but I talk about this on the podcast quite a bit. Um, you also say that entrepreneurs create their own reality, which I like to say to people all the time, actually. And with it, our reality too. That's not what I also say, but I think that's great because they are creating the things today with the network externalities that these products have. They're impacting society dramatically, like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you know. Um, so good, it's so true. One more thing um, I really like that you said was we control our own thoughts and we control our time. Um, we all have the choices with and how and whom to spend our time with. If it's one of, it is one of the most important choices that you make. And it's kind of what I was saying before about you surrounding yourself with those people um, in your life. Now, the purpose of my podcast interviewing high achievers that I call docents 
um, like you, who, you know, is that I wanted, I wanted to try to understand the most common personality characteristics of, of these people to understand as a blueprint for people. And I want to write a book on it. And, um, but what I'm starting to realize is that those things are a given, right? For high achievers. It's, I think it's who you're surrounding yourself with, you know, or reading a lot like you do, right? But you have to expand your mind and you have to think differently and you have to keep challenging yourself and have introspection and, and constantly have self-awareness and balance your ego and pride and stuff. These are the kind of, you know, all this other stuff, it's not nearly as important as the mindset, right? And that mindset is developed by the people I think you surround yourself with. I used to say this on stage all the time. Um, so, uh, but name one entrepreneur, name one entrepreneur that is exactly the same as the next, next one. Is Elon Musk the same as Steve Jobs? Name all of those entrepreneurs, Bill Gates, or any of these entrepreneurs that people think, oh, I need to be like them. The, the, the whole thing is they're all outliers in their own way. Yeah. And the thing that makes them really strong is being outliers. And the thing that makes them we and either crazy or strong, right? It's a fine line. Um, and then bringing a team around that can 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 soften your hard edges and so, uh, something is the thing that makes it. So, so we all have um, incredible skill sets incre that we can make better and better and better if we, if we take them. The point is, if you're like everybody else, you're average. You're average. Yep. That's the results will be average. You'll see average. You'll, you'll see, if you read what everybody else do does, you'll see the same, same, same things. Um, stepping outside of that is, and we're talking a lot about it, is accountability. What do I want my life to look like? That's right. I'm going to build on this and I'm, I, I, I try not to, I'll try not to go to, down to the sand on this, but this is something that I'm very interested in. Just if you think about uh, quantum and our own reality and everything else, mm -hmm. so I'm going to try to not go all, but I'll use an, 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 a, a, um, an example in a crowded room. Um, we, we believe that we can multitask, but we can't, we can only, we, we see one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And and if you, MR, if you did an MRI of your brain while, while things are going on, not the MRI of brain in a crowded room, you'll see what I'm talking about. So you'll see those, uh, you'll see dots and everything else kind of creating a cascade of, um, it's called a P3 wave across your consciousness on the thing that you're focused on comes into your consciousness. And all of the while in that room, there's a million other things that are going on that your brain is actually picking up as well. It's just not coming into your consciousness. And so it, let's say it's blind to you, totally blind to you. You and I are having a conversation in a crowded room. Everything else is blind, even though it's going on. You can feel the temperature. Your brain knows everything that's all going on, but it doesn't actually reach your level of, I can make a decision on this. Somebody says your name, Jay, across the room. And all of a sudden you're tuned out of my conversation. You're in a different conversation. And if you saw that on, a, on, on, on an imaging, it would have created a P3 wave across your brain. So that P3 wave is, is uh, it could be um, the quantum reality changing for you. So you see that opportunity or to, so now think about how that plays in our whole life. Most of the stuff we don't see, most of the stuff we're totally blind to the victim totally blind to what the world could look like the other totally blind but open doors everywhere conversations everywhere massive opportunity everywhere we don't see it because of our our mental models that we're, we're we focus on the thing we're focused on and don't realize a lot of times that same thing we're focused on is preventing us from seeing everything else tie that into this whole conversation about so once you're able to see that and a lot of that construct is in your own mind you're able to see more open doors. You're able to see. And I think actually what's happening, and we'll get into Bitcoin and everything else too, sure. is I think that that same thing is happening if you just imagine that P3 way of coming across one person and then they can't unsee what's happening, <laughs> right? And and um, in now thinking about that infecting more and more people, but it's still blind to the majority of the population. They can't see it. They never heard Jay across the room because they can't see it. Mm. But more and more, more and more, it's that cascading across society. And every single thing, every single thing in our lives is from an idea first. You're right. Right. We create our own reality. We create and, and like, like I wrote in the book. And so if we believe in a different reality and more of the, uh, more of the world believes in a reality, it just shifts to, to that, uh, to that. So it, it might be an interesting way to look at, 
that to it, but it seems to be true. It seems to be true in everyone I see. Um, and and people, but people believe that other people, um, uh, other people, uh, can't, they can't believe that. So if you understand Bitcoin, they can't believe that other people don't. Right. But the better, the better way to look at it is they're blind to it. They're completely blind to it. Just like the victim is blind to abundance. It blows my mind. I don't want to get into this too detail right now because I want to get to it, this later, but like it blows my mind that like Warren Buffett isn't recognizing, I mean, even, even Ray Dalio has capitulated and said, you know, you should have a piece of Bitcoin in your portfolio, a small allocation. I mean, the Buffett, we'll get into that later, but I guess there's no cash flow. Yep. He'll never understand it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to move on to, so I'm reading this book, right? And I read your background, you have a very similar background to me in some ways with the internet entrepreneur for, for quite a while. I don't have the earlier background in construction and stuff of that nature and building and stuff, but as an entrepreneur and online, you and I share something there. I love the book, simply brilliant, the way it was written. Um, and there's a reason for that, because I, I like how you go down the rabbit hole and exponentiality and stuff like that. So I think it's really important because people don't understand exponential growth. It's really sad. That's why most people don't invest. You know, um, I couldn't stop thinking to myself while reading the book, how the hell did Jeff become such an expert on macroeconomics? <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. Like, cause you seem like an expert at this. It's like, you had a whole nother career that has nothing to do with this. So how do you go from being this incredible internet founder, entrepreneur, runs a great business for 20 years, had a little bad luck at the end, obviously, but had the, had the, had the, uh, character walk away, um, it growing a $500 million business and doing that. And then you become like the hottest macroeconomics author that I think I've read in the last year or two. <laughs> so tell me, cause you really get it. You really get it. Tell me how that happens. Like, how did you go down this rabbit hole? Because what I was reading, you really did to, I mean, probably partially to write the book, but also you were deep in the rabbit hole to begin with is why you wrote the book. It, it happened out of, again, same thing as an entrepreneur goes through. Um, I looked at the construct, I couldn't understand, I really couldn't understand, and this is 10 years before writing the book, why prices weren't coming down everywhere. Yeah. Because because I lived in a world and I saw the front edge of a world, the prices should be coming down everywhere. Like if you look at your phone, um, every app on it, it's for, like it's free. Your, your comparison to like the cell phone from 1988 to now, it's like, that was great. Because <laughs> my, my uncle had one of those. I remember I was like this clunky thing in the car, the wire, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. And, and so, so how can that not provide abundance and prices even coming down? And so I kept, and not, and then if it's accelerating more and more and more, I just couldn't, I couldn't get it. And so now, now projecting into the future, um, what would happen against a system that had to go the other way. So as I investigated that, I got more and more concerned. And one of the things I, I kind of mentioned it before the accountability, um, is what drives that investigation. When I when I can't understand something sufficiently that I can explain it easily, like mm -hmm. to a five year old, then um, then I don't know it well enough. And 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 so so a lot of people will gloss over it because they think by saying big words or something like that, somebody else will uh, is a, they'll trust their intelligence. I want to simplify it in my own mind, down to the sand, and and that creates this this, um, <laughs> I, I can't stop learning. And I've, and, and so I've done that total obsession. It's right. a, it, it's a yep. total obsession and I take it down in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and one of the things you realize is a system measures a system by the system. Yes. That's what I was reading in your book too. You're just, you're, this is one of the reasons why it perpetuates. Yeah. Why Jay, you totally get this. A lot of other entrepreneurs will get this. It's, it's, it's also the, why it's hard to raise money and it's also hard to everything else because you're not measuring that system and everybody else is measuring that system. You're not. And so people say, where's the data when you have an idea? Well, the point is there is no data because I'm creating reality. I'm creating the new. So you, it's an, it's more like art than the, um, right. And, and so think about this phone. It's only 15 years old. Um, 15 years ago, the entire world thought you had to have buttons on the phone because it's the only way. Even a year or two that. afterwards, I still had the BlackBerry. Right. <laughs> exactly. But think about how many people laughed that innovation off um, and what the world looked like. And again, that was like an ADBC kind of thing, right? BCA day. It was like, boom, the world changed. Uh, it was just the like world, that. world, world yeah. changed. And, and that's how, that's how those breakthroughs happen. And, but you can't, it's a, it's, it's like art. It's like, I have this belief 
that this is the way the world will work and this is the value that I'm going to deliver to society when the world works like this mm -hmm. and we're, when more people use this, it's going to be way more valuable for them um, against a traditional belief. And so that is that is what entrepreneurs do. If you look at what my book did or what I what Bitcoin does or everything else, it is that belief, mm -hmm. right? It is this system can't work like this. And it's that it's a belief in a new way of working. But I totally understand why so many people are trapped in the existing system as a mm -hmm. result of it, because because everybody measures their wealth, everything else by the system. There's something in the book. So you go really deep down the rabbit hole on exponential growth. Um, a lot of different examples yeah. and stuff, how technology is inherently and by nature deflationary. It's the entire premise of the book in some ways um, due to Moore's law. And the rapid and accelerating exponential growth of the innovation, the speed of the innovation, that kind of drives down the cost and efficiencies over time, increases efficiencies, right? So that's what we're seeing. But to your point, well, why weren't the prices moving, right? So, um, so products continue to just get faster. They get cheaper, you're basically saying. And I like that you give long, drawn-out examples of this throughout the book, right? And you, you, instead of just going quick on that moving, because I think you'll lose people. I'm gonna read something that you had in here. I sent this to my father-in-law. He's an educator for 40 years, my, my, my mother-in-law as well. Um, they're pretty smart people, you know, but they're stuck in the system, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sent this to him. It says, in 2000, the total debt globally was $62 trillion and the world economy was 33.5 trillion. And since 2000, the world economy has grown from 33.5 trillion to 80 trillion. But to achieve that growth, the total debt has grown to 247 trillion as of Q3 of 2018. It's taken $185 trillion in global debt to achieve $46 trillion of global growth. And if we stop adding to the debt and started to pay back at a rate of $1,000 a second, it would take 8,000 years to pay back. Instead, we keep adding to it. Crazy. <laughs> if, you took, uh, if, you took the, if you took $185 trillion in debt to only get to $46 trillion in global growth, it will take at least double that to get to another $46 trillion in growth, which you go out over future part of the chapters, I think chapter four. Imagine going to the bank, asking them for $4 in debt for a dollar in growth. <laughs> I think you get laughed out of the bank, right? Um, even if you tax- that's not a, By the way, that's, that's not a dollar in profit. It's a dollar right, in exactly. It's, a dollar profit. <laughs> it's insane, right? Yeah. Even if it's taxed entirely on the $1, all of it, 100% tax, yeah. um, that would never buy back the original loan, right? So it's a mirage of growth. Today, nothing more than debt-fueled spending binge. My father-in-law, who will watch this interview, so Bob, how you doing? <laughs> um, he writes uh -huh. me back and he goes, well, I won't be here in 8,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know he's half joking, but I'm like, the problem is that's, that is the exact thing you're talking about. They're just kicking the can to the future in the system, right? Um, if we can, so yeah, we, you know, it's going on here, continue, you see inflation today. We have inflation, right? Which is clearly due to all the money printing, as you point out in the book, right? There's no other reason why we would have it. They just keep adding debt and money into the system. Sure. And, to try to push these prices up. You point out that Ray Dalio has correctly pointed out that when debt gets too large, there's only four levers that the policymakers can pull, right? Um, to try to bring it back down. Austerity, spend less. Debt default or restructuring. Trump said some, something about that before he became president. Oh, that scared the crap of anyone when he became president. I was like, he's gonna default. <laughs> um, higher taxes on the rich is another, you know, transferring wealth from the haves to the have nots. But that, even if he took all their money, it wouldn't fix the problem. Um, and then central bank money printing which seems to be what they're doing, right? Because it's the path of least resistance. It's just it's easy to do, right? Politically, it's easy to do. In the end, the policymakers, you said, always decide to just print. They just keep printing, right? Because austerity causes more pain than benefit. Restructuring wipes out too much wealth too fast. And transferring from the haves to the have-nots um, does not happen without a revolt, right? So the burning question I had while I was reading this, it's like the game of musical chairs, Jeff, right? So how long can these policymakers keep the party going with these policies of just print, 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 print? Because it's going to have to, because of exponential, it's going to have to accelerate to levels that we can't even fathom in 30 years. And if the printing, if you keep printing, will the party just continue indefinitely or will the debt grow so large at a certain point that everyone loses confidence and faith in the dollar collapses no matter what they do and we all move into something like Bitcoin? Is that what happens in the end because they'll just keep doing it until it happens? So I'm going to actually speak to Bob here. Right. The uh, so because if you look outside your window and you see the signposts, the negative externalities of the positive externality that you have from that printing, you will see what ends up happening. And and it doesn't matter if you're here in eight thousand years; it won't take eight thousand years. <laughs> um, and and so if you if you want to grow up in a society like that, or you want your kids or grandkids to grow up in a society like that, 
this is what it will look like. When you keep doing that, because inflation is 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 actually the most regressive tax in, uh, around. It's it's really hidden theft built into the base layer of money. But it's th theft of the middle class and poor to the rich. So it's Robin Hood in reverse. Because inflation, the opposite side of the same coin is wage deflation and mm -hmm. savings deflation. So if you own houses and everything else, they're going up. And if you don't, they're going down. So so this divide of society is as exactly as a result of this ha this happening. More and that was just Jeff. The part that's going down is their buying power, the ability to even get assets. The buying power, yeah. they're real. Yeah, exactly. Because they don't own the assets, terms, so it's it's the ability to even get them. Just to exactly. completely. So more people living on the street, mm -hmm. more people. You look at this. Well, and why they make they less because we have it? technology and automation and all this other stuff over time. It's just they're not going to need that. Labor. And that's moving faster and faster it's and gonna faster. It's going to be increasing amounts way. of people just, competing for jobs, you, basically. Yep. If you imagine two lines, one line moving down, mm -hmm. technology wanting to, yeah. to reduce costs, the other line saying, um, we're going to do whatever we can to increase prices, including destroy money. The government, yeah. So we're going to print no matter what to keep prices higher. Mm -hmm. At which point there's a whole bunch of people below this line and more falling below that line all the time that can't pay for the prices that are artificially higher in, in the first place. And those people change governments because a new elected leader comes in and, and, and grabs hold of them and says, Populism. it's their fault. It's their fault. And you, we need to go after them. And those assets that people think are safe, those houses that can't be moved because they're part of the state, <laughs> get redistributed through revolution and war. And that's what, and, 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 and that path must end there. It doesn't, it's not a, it's not an, it, if it does, it must end there. And in, um, in less, and every time you're doing that as you, as you're destroying, as you're manipulating uh, money more and more to be able to do this and continuing uh, that on what you're actually doing, uh, what you're doing is concentrating more power into the state, more power in politicians, and the state has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and it removes more of the free market. And so Jay, you're an entrepreneur and everything else. And, and really, and all of this innovation comes out of the free market. Mm -hmm. Most of the innovation comes out of the, uh, the free market. So, and that pro produces productivity that enhances our lives. If that productivity is stolen by a few people at the top, whether it's a top of a political system or top of the, the very wealthy in that political system, um, that can, can essentially get the politicians they want elected. Whether it looks like that or not, it keeps on concentrating. Now play these two things forward where we are, not where we were in the past in, in a historical lens, look to the future. Where we were in the past, where we are today, how many people stand up in, in Russia and try to uh, try to fight the system, mm -hmm. right? Navalny and what happens to him. And, and so when you're in it, how many people stand up in North Korea and fight the system? Mm -hmm. How many people stand up in China and fight the system? How many people, if you want a system that can concentrates power unilaterally in, in somebody's hands and nobody stands up when we have historical uh, references ever think about, I hate using this example, but it, it, here's why I use the example in Germany. It, I don't use the example for, um, because the same thing happened to, to, it can happen anywhere. To power. Yeah. But, but, but what about the 99% of the people that went along with it? Now think about yourself. How, how, how likely are we to stand up against that? And we're not likely. The evidence is really clear that You're we're more not likely, likely to try to run. <laughs> more, more likely to try to, to, to gain favor in that system or to, uh, or, or, or to hide in that system because the people who stand up get killed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, now think about that system with artificial intelligence and robotics. And if you want life to look like that for your kids or grandkids, then vote to keep that system going. If you don't, vote Bitcoin. That's it. It's that simple. Because there is no other path. There is no other path right now that I've seen. And I've gone out to every different path understanding this. And I, by the way, I'm always open for another alternative. I will, uh, I'll debate the other alternative. I'll look at it. But if you, you can imagine on that book, you can imagine how much work I do on, on this. I have not yet seen another path 
that doesn't provide that outcome that is not Bitcoin. I love the rabbit hole that you go down on the exponential um, growth and understanding exponential because I really think that it is a challenge for, I think it's a challenge for even us, to, but realistically, if you want to be honest, to understand exponential. But we have an understanding, and but it seems amazing still, no matter how many times I understand it, right? Um, you know, I've been saying this for years about Wall Street, by the way, I was a Facebook investor pre-IPO um, through secondary shares. And on the IPO, I sold it because I had an angel investor in my company that was from Wall Street. And he's telling me that Wall Street's going to sell it off because Mark Zuckerberg on the roadshow <laughs> was a shithead or something. And I'm like, what? I go, were you the same guy telling me just weeks before that everybody has to own it because it's $100 billion? He's like, yeah, you got to own it. Doesn't mean you have to support the price. I'm like, I don't like Wall Street at all. Okay, I sold the stock. It dropped to 18, as you know. And he goes, calls me up, you should buy it back. I'm like, I'm not buying it back. You guys are flaky. <laughs> so I just, I don't like public stocks. I mean, I'll do the averages, but I don't, individually. Um, you know, and, and Buffett, you know, I think there's a reason why Wall Street doesn't understand, does, they don't understand exponential is what I've seen, right? It's not just regular people. Even the smartest investor in the world, they've miscalculated exponential growth so many times on technology companies that come public. Uh, you could just see it because they look off their earnings and they're caring about what happened three months ago. And you're like, what is going on? This is a secular growth trend for the next 30 years. How do you not see it? Um, and, you know, Warren Buffett is a great example. He's underperformed the NASDAQ for the last 10 plus years. Doesn't get it, you know? He's like, well, it doesn't have cash flow. <laughs> it's like the only thing yeah. he's thinking about, yeah. right? Um, I think humans are really, really bad at kind of understanding exponential um, pattern behaviors, you know? Um, and the rate of change is exponential, as you said in the book. Um, I've been seeing this for like 20 years. The businesses I built were like a social network, the first video sharing site, like these things were about exponential growth and virality and all that kind of stuff. Um, most people don't understand this stuff, like, you know? Um, Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, as you mentioned, has exponential growth but not just by the users, that's also growing exponentially, but it's a monetary network. American HODL kind of clued me into this one. I thought it was a great way to think about it. And now I hear Saylor talking about it as well. Every dollar that goes in is like a new participant, right? So if Stevie Cohen, who was just at Skybridge Capital Salt Conference uh, yesterday said, uh, we're getting in, right? And I'm like, oh, that's huge news in terms of adoption for the dollars. It's only one more yeah. individual. He's gonna bring billions of dollars potentially into this into this asset class, which is really kind of interesting and important because uh, you know the, the network grows by the dollars. And when he comes in and he outperforms them because it's all about the performance of their funds, other funds will kind of jump in and it could you start seeing, and then a lot of people that have a lot of money, family offices and others, they're not in, not necessarily because they don't believe, it just can't move the needle for them at the current market caps and stuff. So I think for a, at least years ago, but you start seeing billions of dollars come in with a 25 to 100x multiplier on the value. I think you're going to see this thing moving up faster, which could have a faster and faster adoption rate than people may otherwise have thought because of that exponential growth, I'm saying, right? It's going to happen faster, I think people think. And that could be the impetus for getting out of the current system. And you're going to see a lot of money extracted out of other assets like real estate, which has a lot of store value and, and stocks. They may start to escape and come over to yeah. this asset. So yes. And uh, so- it, you, that paper folding thing that I did, did in the book. So all the way, you fold a paper 50 times and it goes to the sun. Um, I the, the the thing is, I've asked that question to tens of thousands of people all over the world, and, and just about everybody guesses two inches. Right. Um, and uh, bef uh, before they know. And it just blows the brain. And I know what ends up happening right after that speech is they're on their phones looking, at, looking at, to Google to know it can't be. Right. But the point is, it's actually the exact same thing that you, you just said. Why we underestimate technology or we overestimate technology early. Um, Amari's printing, yep. AI, everything else is everybody tells us it's going to be where it is on fold 34, 35 to the sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's at fold one or two. It's yeah. early. So and, and so nothing happens. It doesn't move, but it keeps on doubling. It keeps on. Wait, can we just pause you, for those that you did in the fold site? You said if you took a piece of paper and you folded how many times? Fifty, right? Fifty times on itself. Fifty times on itself. It fifty times. If you go, how many times? How how large will it get? Just for people who haven't read the book yet, that's what he's saying. So go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, yep. I just want to make sure that everybody understood. But on those early folds, yep. uh, it doesn't do anything. Fold a no. piece of paper one, two, three, four times. It's nothing. And so, so when people tell you that this technology is going to change the world and it shows up and it doesn't change the, and it's it, like, th think about 3d printing, what people in, in, in their brains right now is these useless 3d printers that they print little uh, trinkets with, and it takes a day. That's not where 3d printing looks like right now, let alone where it's going. I mean, it changes industries massively, mm -hmm. but that's, but, but again, when that shows up, when the first prototypes of that thing show up, it doesn't do what people expected, 
and so they discount the entire innovation. Palm Pilot versus this, right? <laughs> and so and, and um, so quick. and so it doesn't. And so they say, oh, that's that's all that it will never work. Now that's what's happening in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and and where are we versus the uh, versus that time? So now remember, in that example, what our natural inclination to do is not project the trend of the future on an exponential. What we what we do is we project our present reality forward. And ask everybody ser seriously that is listening to this. Ask yourself how well you are at projecting the exponential versus projecting the current trend forward. Hmm. You live in your own world. You have all your biases of the exact same world, and you project all of the. This one thing might change, but everything else doesn't change as a result. <laughs> so, because and 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 that's what's happening today in the world. And so, where are we on that path? Um, Bitcoin specifically is like investing in a TCP T, a, IP to invest in the protocol layer of the internet. Um, most of the value of the internet came on layer two of mm -hmm. the internet, Amazon, Google, and everything else. And yep. no one could invest in the primary layer. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, the store of value Bitcoin is like investing in the internet itself. And what year are we in if we compare the internet? And they're running at the same rate, internet adoption, and uh, it's just overlaid at a different time. We're in 1996. Interesting. That's what the adoption rate is right now for Bitcoin. Okay. So think about the internet. I actually know they had 44 million users on the internet in 1996. I actually know that. Yeah, yep. exactly. Think about what the internet looked like in 90, 1996, 97. Right. Mm -hmm. You couldn't download a cat video without it taking a week, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, um, Netflix, Google, all of those came, uh, uh, Facebook, all of those came way later. Think about what the world looked like there. Think about the the Paul Krugman and uh, what was it ninety eight said the internet's going to make the same difference uh, to economies uh, as the fax machine. Um, and so think about all of the go look at the go look at some of the articles from from then how people missed the internet. Oh yeah, big time. Katie Couric, the clip is the best ever, where she's like, "What's a dot com com." <laughs> And the types of companies that uh, that had all the power at that time, yeah, that missed this exponential trend versus today. That's what's happening on Bitcoin. Even Mike, actually... even Bill Gates admitted it in the interviews. Totally. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, ex exactly. Well, they missed Microsoft. Missed Google. Right. Microsoft. Um, they, they they missed because, a lot of because, things. Right. Be, be, because you couldn't monetize free search. Right. right. So it, why would it, why would anybody do that? And so, and so Bill Gross again, invented I, in Idea Lab <laughs> over time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I, by the way, Bill Gross is fantastic. He's a great genius. He's a, yeah. I, I met, you mentioned in the book um, something that I actually meant. I, I interviewed Lou Kerner in here. He's my second or third interview on my show. He bought yeah. one of my companies. He was an investor in my company. I've known him for like 15 plus years. And uh, he was the, the founding CEO for Dot TV for Bill Gross. And he told me the right. exact same thing. We talked about it in the interview. He brought up what you had in the book, which was his talk, the TED talk, where he says about luck, you know, um, yeah. timing is everything. Um, but, but, and you give all the percentages and everything. But I actually cut through on a B-roll on the interview with Lou, that exact uh, speech that he had, you know, just that one part. I was, it's so funny you had yeah. it in the book. I was like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. um, but again, it, but it forces you, if you're accountable and everything else, you realize that this exponential, if you mistime that as an entrepreneur, yep. if you're too early, you fail. You're if you're yeah. too late, it's already gone. And but, but now back to Bitcoin. So now you have this network effect growing at the same rate of the internet and people could essentially invest in the internet itself, internet of money itself. Um, that's growing at, at, at that rate, and you and and then layer two is actually another exponential that's feeding back onto layer one. So I I totally even if you said Ethereum and all of the other coins, I actually understand why people why why there was a potential place for Ethereum before because Bitcoin did a different job. Yeah. Right. And if Ethereum was trying to do a different job, a computer network of the world, and then for NFTs and everything else, Bitcoin didn't really have at that time a network to do that. And so Ethereum uh, took, took that. Now Bitcoin does. And it reinforces the primary network. And so I totally understand why Ethereum is trying to change and it's uh, uh, because, because <laughs> their gas because fees are ridiculous. They're the going to get, yeah, they're going to get, they're going to get killed because now, now tied onto the primary network, you have something that scales infinitely. 
and and there's still more work to do on lightning and everything else, sure. but they reinforce each other. So I suspect on Ethereum and a bunch of these other things, what looks like a network effect will unwind really fast. That's my belief because, because of now, because now, um, because unless Ethereum now creates um, a store of value that is better than Bitcoin, which is virtually impossible, is yeah. impossible, then everything under it likely fails in time. So you even think like uh, the NFT space, all this will just be on top of Bitcoin when it all gets, when the layer two gets more situated. Okay, that's interesting. Because it makes more sense. It's it, it, again, it, the it's incentives the protocol for market, the new internet, the, essentially. The money. Exactly. The, the, the incentives of the market and the mm -hmm. cost structure of, of that, uh, that market will drive the price to make sure that it does. But how fast do you think something like that could happen? We've seen this kind of revolution, this, this adoption. It's like the old gradually, then phew, suddenly, you know? And it's like, do we see that happen in 10 years? 15, five, like, what do you, cause you never can tell. No, I hope it takes time. Okay. Oh, cause of the chaos ensuing as a result of it. So, so, th so think about the two systems that we're operating in, and this is a network transfer. From yeah. One, two. Yep. And the, and, 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 and if, if the existing, so let's, let's use an example and let's say today the fed, the fed is going to print forever and it has to be exponentially more all the mm -hmm. time forever. When they talk about easing, good luck. They can't. Same as EU, same as everywhere else, same as China, this ever grand thing. They're going to have to because of the cascading under un, unwind. Unraveling. If, yep. uh, unraveling. If they, allow, if they don't print, then the, what people thought was money is evaporated to more. Like it just un, keeps on unwinding. Every bank fails. Every it, it just keeps on unwinding, because the asset prices are only those asset prices because you've put lever so much leverage against those asset prices, mm -hmm. and you can't pay back the debt. So you have to you have to continue to to print more and more and more to pretend you can pay back the debt. If that if that inver if there's an inversion, then it is chaos on the street. And because today in, in the US, Canada, and everything else, you can't pay with your Bitcoin. It's too hard to, and everything else. You don't have a network that is that is ready to be able to move the transition. Um, it would be complete chaos. Right, we gotta, we gotta get layer two up and running full speed essentially. And yeah, be prepared for it. Yeah, we're not quite ready for it. Exactly, it's, so it needs to take time and yeah. needs, to, it lo needs to look like it, it needs to look like the internet now, not the internet in 1996. Okay. Um, is there a downside to a technology led deflationary world on a Bitcoin standard in the future? Do you see a downside to that? Like, do you, did you foresee downsides that Bitcoiners maybe not seeing? Like, they're just oblivious to this possibly because we're so echo chambered? I, I saw that question asked and I thought, I thought it was a really, really good question. Um, and, and, and so, Yes, but not the downsides that people probably think through the existing lens of the system. So when I say yes, I'm, and and the upsides are far better, like far uh, far better. But what are some of the things that you would need to work on in the transition, right? Why people are fear are really fearful of the transition is a fearful of the jobs going away because of technology, and they're wondering what they would do. Yep. to pay for their yep. uh, pay for their family when the jobs go away. Now, we have to break those two things because we know the jobs are going to go away anyways. And I would ask by pushing up prices higher and higher and higher artificially, we live in a mirage of a world that who decides what prices go up? Who decides how much of our labor to steal? our time to steal mm -hmm. by, by printing higher and higher. And so now you have people up on a cliff, right, higher and higher on a cliff, where the real market is here. That's great. And if they fall off, what do they do, right? And so they go back to that same government to say, help me, right? But the government can't provide the money. Where does the money come from? If, if you believe that the money comes from nowhere and you just, then why do we even have markets? And so, so that, that relies on a belief system that there's a couple people at the very top of the pyramid that and the rest you have modern day slavery. So um, that's what that belief system would look like over time into that. But again, it's really important to detach. The jobs are going to go anyways. Now, what allows that to happen in the best way? As labor comes out of the market, should prices fall in lockstep? And I would say yes, right? The Why wouldn't 
it, it, it would be it, it would make it more sustainable as the transition starts to happen yeah and again these these are concepts that we're going to yeah imagine your rent if twenty five hundred dollars a month in rent goes down to five hundred dollars a month in rent and they have less and income then, and then four hundred okay. and then three hundred and then two hundred and then one hundred and um yeah. and and it keeps on falling and it keeps on falling and falling mm -hmm. as a result of this transition to technology that does our work right that's actually why we use it it does more and more of our work and so so I use this. I've used this example often, but economics is is about uh, scarcity, not about value. Mm -hmm. So, the air you breathe is abundant, and that's why it's free. You only pay for air underwater or in space, right? The uh, um, where it's not abundant. And so, so when you when when you use that concept, could we hire a bunch of people to keep prices even higher and retain more jobs by running around beside us, giving us air? We could it doesn't make much sense right there's uh, you, like you, you you laugh at that and you go that's insane well how is that any more insane than what we're doing to try to keep jobs <laughs> that in, in, a, in a market that's moving more and more things that are free and that's kind of a, a, an important concept so so but on the way there on the way there it, here's one of the potential uh, negatives you would still have to have some sort of taxes you would still have to have, and and a lot of people miss on a Bitcoin standard um, that that the way to gain more Bitcoin is to produce more value to others. And if you tried to control the network, then you would control Bitcoin. If you hired more people to gain control, what it means is distributing your Bitcoin. But now let's imagine a, a world where you build up a new leverage system on Bitcoin and nobody ever sells their Bitcoin and they use the l leverage um, instead, right? Sure. On top of that, you've just transferred control to new power brokers and depending on those actors, taxes, what does it look like for the rest of the world? So I think there's, there's a bunch of things to, to work on, on this, on this transfer. And everything else and for me what for me what i think about is what i really want is uh is uh, uh or what what i think i want the abundance of to our of to where technology is going to be as broadly distributed as, as possible i want a free market mm -hmm. i am uh, i am perfectly willing to pay my pay my share of taxes um not in what government looks like today but in, in, in a government that's going to tell me the truth of where taxes go. Because right to today, none of the taxes are actually required. Most of the money comes from inflation. Right. And so, so all of the political parties on both sides, you'd have to ask if most of your revenue comes from inflation, um, then, then would you be willing to turn that off? And they won't. They can't. I want my kids to grow up in a world where they can trust the truth and integrity and everything else. And then the elect and then, then our elected leaders who we vote in are actually having policies that I believe you should have a firefighter on your street. Um, here's what it would cost for that to happen. And it would be an honest conversation, right? Somebody else would say, I don't think you should have a firefighter. <laughs> Right. I know I, I know I want to vote for a firefighter <laughs> um, and I'm happy to pay my fair share to make that that happen. I don't want to come. I don't want to come out of my citadel into chaos. Right. And, and so what, what I think will happen with with this is there'll be competition um, by governments and, and by re regions to be, provide the, um, the best for society. And that competition will be uh, will be based on the truth. So, uh, Jeff, you, you talk about, um, the transition where we're, we're getting to the, tr I like that we're kind of moving through the, the, the way this is all playing out. It's how the way it will play out. Right. So this is the transition I would call it, right. Where we're moving towards a hyper Bitcoinization world at some point, the speed of which that happens to your point, it's really hard to predict to your point. Also probably better if it takes longer than, than sooner than that wouldn't be so good. I feel like the entrenched incumbents, both political and, um, commercial, right they're going to want to hang on as long as possible, right? Because it's like the contillion effect. They're closest to the money printer. They, they don't, they don't want to let go of this. Um, maybe that's why we don't see them coming out publicly and, and in support of Bitcoin, because they really maybe do get it, you know? Um, but what I've noticed is, uh, and you talk about this in a book is they're kind of pitting people against each other as a distraction. Um, 
you know, whether that's through whatever those wedges may be, right? They create wedges for us. How do you see us getting past that? And then, you know, we're heading down this path of uh, totalitarianism, which, you know, few individuals basically are controlling everything, which you point out in the book. You have, not that they're controlling everything, but they, you know, I think you said uh, 5% of Americans now have two thirds of, of, of the wealth in America and three individuals, I don't know if it's changed now because Elon's gotten richer, but three individuals have 50% of the wealth, right? Which I think was Gates, Buffett, Bezos. Yeah. I just want to be clear though. It's really not their fault, right? For the Because I, I can't stand this, like this is the narrative shift to blame and stuff, right? It's really not their fault. They're just smart. They understand the Fed policies. If they sit in cash, they're being debased. They're losing value and buying power. So they buy assets. The assets go up. Politicians like AOC, Elizabeth Warren and others come on TV and say, oh, they're getting rich. They're the problem. But they didn't create this. They're the ones that are voting these policies in or not getting rid of them. Do you think they're aware of this AOC, Liz Warren, and and all this? Even Trump, for that matter, right? Trump was the trade war guy, which you've talked about. First currency, then trade wars, then real wars. They're all playing into the Dalio thing, right? It's like it's amazing. And 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 your friend, their parents said this in the in what the two thousand around two thousand eight crisis. They were eighty years old at the time, and they said it. Now Dalio's been pounding that drum for the last three years on on a book tour, um, for his death cycle book and stuff. Um, do you think they understand what's going on or do you think they're completely oblivious? I mean, they have, yeah, Hank Polson in government, there's a treasury. Like, how do these guys not know? They, there's people in there that okay. know. There are, there are a lot of people that come on to me and, uh, and, and say, Jeff, they know it's, it's all orchestrated. But I get that on Twitter all the time. Right. I can tell you by looking in the, the, the eyes of these, some of these people, they don't. Um, I, I wish they did. Um, it, 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 because at least, it, it, and could another couple people know? Yes. Couple of, some, some of them might know. But they are so stru- stuck in a crowded room thing that I said they were so blind to it and their entire wealth is because of it. Mm. And and so they've tuned out. It, they're, they're completely blind. They don't see the negative externalities in some cases. They don't see the, they haven't gone through this. I, um, I saw another question about An- Andrew Yang. Well, I, one thing I will say, and I'm not gonna tell you whether he will come on Bitcoin or not, that's up to him to decide. Um, but what I will tell you is privately, we had a very, very, and, and, and many of these people privately, very, very open, uh, conversation. And he asked, he said this to me, he said, how many people on Bitcoin have actually done the work that you have that, 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 uh, that really understand what this looks like? Because I don't see, he goes, I Mm -hmm. don't see it. I see this polarization and everything else. And when, and when. People in a system are f- really fearful of something. They don't want to move to more fear. And so, but again, that I would say, I've talked to many politicians. Uh, I, I'm constantly asked by, by banks, or like, yeah, I'll get four requests a day of different people that, that, want, uh, that want to have this conver- conversation. But it's one thing, hold on, it's one thing to not fully understand it. But then like the AOCs and Elizabeth the, the, and, and, and Bernie Sanders, they're blaming the wealthy. like. Do they really think the wealthy are creating these problems? That we're not in control of the policies. I don't understand that. Some of them actually do believe that. Wow. They actually believe. They they actually believe that. They can't. They haven't looked deep enough. This and and like again, what is the reason why the assets this, are going up? This is so. Fr- this this is so fringe. It's so blind to them. And let's just imagine imagine this. Uh, to take the victim example, take the billionaire example, take all of these examples and. Everybody all around them says, "Yes, thank you. You did. The, you're finally the one who 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 did uh, did this." It's those people, and a whole bunch of society feels that, right? And so they reinforce most of what they see. Yeah, confirmation is, bias. is that over and over and over and over again, and then and then what we see, a very small part of the of the part at this at this level, what we see is what, right? It, we can't unsee it, but the same thing is happening to them. They can't unsee it on, on the other uh, other thing, and and they don't actually want to even. So they they are that. getting the counsel from people like you. They are getting the advice. They're just not listening for their biases. Their biases are blinding them. Their 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 biases and their need to belong. Their need to belong. Their entire entire system of what they've created power from, or or. Let's just think about the power that Elizabeth Warren has to be able to come forward and say, I got it wrong, guys. This is the problem. Everybody, she's got a support group already. They're going to support her regardless. So, so how many people do that? 
How many? So, so we talked about this earlier. You you said what are the things that that that, that you do with accountability and everything mm -hmm. else. And if I'm wrong, I'll uh, I'll, I'll say I'm wrong and and, and right. move forward. I got this wrong. Uh, that's actually why I think that's one of the reasons the book uh, did so well because I, I I'm honest, vulnerable, and a whole bunch mm -hmm. of these things that I get wrong too. Yeah. Um and uh and but how many people actually do that? And um and and so. Look at Michael Saylor's tweet about Bitcoin five years ago. <laughs> That's right. I have an email. Listen to this. I have an email to a friend. I it was, it was, When is the first time I had emails? One of the first, it was like in the top 20 emails in like 2012 or something. He's like, what do you think about Bitcoin? I said, it's a scam. Keep thinking about stocks or something like that. I yeah. like, just focus <laughs> on stocks, I think I said. And it's like, I didn't even yeah. look into it. I was just like, I don't, I don't want to look into it. And you shouldn't either. And it was a small market cap and all this kind of stuff. But I didn't go down the rabbit hole. I wasn't looking at the economic system in, in any way, you know? So by the way, I did too. So, uh, and maybe I wasn't as dismissive of Bitcoin, but what I, I didn't have time to investigate it because I was running something else at the level I should have. Uh, even though my developers in my company were saying, hey, you got to take a look at yeah, this. Yeah, you'd and be I a billionaire today. And I <laughs> you would have figured it out earlier. <laughs> uh, totally. And I didn't. And, and I didn't. Um, so, and and think about the path that you're on and, and what you think you always knew, mm -hmm. but you didn't. That's right. That's what's going on in society. Nobody um, wants to believe they're wrong. Are, nobody wants to believe they're wrong. And they're, and they're more and more locked in yeah. to their position. Yeah. And their own bias and their own ego is preventing them from seeing that there might be a different position that is, uh, that, it, that is more congruent with getting the things that they're actually saying they want. Why I talk this way is I will admit there are some people that are totally manipulative and they, they can't see the negative externalities and they could care less. Right. It's just about them. I ad ad admit that. But if you talk like that, that, and you say that that's everybody. I actually believe in hope. I believe most people in, a, in, an, in an incentive line system are going to, uh, you're going to move to peace, love, everything else in an incentive line system. I want to believe in hope. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the few shouldn't outweigh the many. So, so if you think those few people are all bad and you talk like that, you create more fear for other people to explore Bitcoin. If you talk about natural biases and what people do and everything else and how it's natural and yeah, they can make mistakes too. Yeah, I mean, I got it wrong. I, I totally got it wrong. It took me three years to figure it out. <laughs> if you actually understand it from that, that standpoint, then it gives, remember when I said you don't move from fear to fear? Mm -hmm. It gives more people that are scared to look because they're so f fearful of this. It gives more of those people license to look. Yeah. And you bring more people. Up. I mean, the funny thing about your book is that the title and the subtitle and nothing about it says Bitcoin. You don't even mention Bitcoin until the last chapter. It is the obvious solution. As I'm reading through this whole thing, I'm like, when is he going to talk about the solution here? <laughs> He's so obvious where it's leading. I'm like, Jeff's got to be talking about Bitcoin at some point. And then even then, I don't want to get into this now because we'll get to Bitcoin in two seconds. I have a question there before that. But then even when you get it, you kind of say Bitcoin or something like it. And I was like, Jeff, <laughs> we know it's Bitcoin. What's he talking about? But I think you're trying to be, you don't want to look like a maximalist, I think, in the book and, and have a wider, broader. And by the way, I am a maximalist. Yeah, I, I know. Am, I know. <laughs> I, and, but again, when you, when you offer that and you're open to, I might be wrong, then, then people, it's more credible. You don't sound closed minded then. Yeah. And, and, right. and by the way, I'm not closed minded. I'm, I, 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 I want, where was I wrong? What is going, what is it? What's changing? I'm, I'm, I'm I con, con, constantly. And I would say right now, I would say tomorrow, if I, if I saw something that could overtake that, I would say it. You'd admit I it. don't. Yeah. Right. I don't see anything that uh, has a chance. So I'd also say that. I want to go to this deflationary, uh, world, which is the world of abundance. Um, it also means that assets keep declining, right? As we've talked about, there's so much a store of value in things like real estate and stocks and other commodities and stuff. I mean, just there's nowhere to put money in a risk-free. So I think just obviously pushes prices up. Sailor talks about this quite a bit with the 400 trillion and all that stuff, you know? Um, you know, it's kind of like the Japanification of America people talk about if this starts to happen. It's deflationary death spiral, right? This is a scary idea, I think, for most of Americans. So we basically own no assets and you're happy. <laughs> you basically hold Bitcoin, right? Um, which increases in value over time as assets decline in value over time. Uh, there's a downward pricing pressure on the, on the store of value. It keeps sucking it out from all these different other assets into the, into the Bitcoin. Um, 
when do you think people should start making that transition away from the current assets they hold like real estate and what are you doing right now so i i think real estate um is much because if you looked at the how much of value it is in most people's uh, it's way over indexed in most people's portfolio yeah. the average american is pretty much the only asset they own exactly and it's way over indexed by the way that is the thing that gives the state its power to run the system because people people and remember look at other countries that when this is taken back um either through, through totally different tax rates or by force or uh, you can't rent it or whatever yeah. um it, it it doesn't have the same value in a system that is going that must under uh it must be changed as people have traditionally thought so so there, there's this um i think there's this asymm uh, say asymmetric risk in it because you can't move it and if all your wealth is there um it, we'll go back to the germany example yeah. for ex uh, example who got wealthy through that is the same people that were persecuted and and why didn't they get on plane or why didn't they uh, get on boats and leave and, and planes and everything and trains and get out of germany is because all of their wealth was there they couldn't leave mm -hmm. they're trapped in this is trapped in a state that has to do this mm -hmm. and so so <clears throat> when when sailor talks when i talk about about uh, bitcoin being a, a superior store of value um the apex predator in all store, stores of value that's what we're talking about we're talking about that it can't be taken from you no matter where you could you could get on a plane remember 12 words and go anywhere and there's going to be other regions in the world that are going to be begging for you um for capital for for capital entrepreneurs everything else and so it's a it, to to be on zero in bitcoin is the most unsafe thing you could do in the world uh, we're mm -hmm. moving into you're short in bitcoin it, it's it, it's the worst thing you could possibly do and then from there if people just understood that that even as an insurance policy they'll start to look deeper on why and so they'll probably start to increase more and more allocation to Bitcoin. now i wouldn't be as uh i wouldn't ever say uh, it, and this is everybody wants to know my weighting of my portfolio versus what they should do and everything else. I'm mostly, no, no, I'm not even caring about that. I don't care about that so much. What I'm mostly interested in, Jeff, is clearly we're short assets, asset value. Yeah. Ma majority yeah. of asset value is probably uh, store value now. So when do you foresee that that makes sense to say, it, and I don't know if you have this, but like we have some rental properties and stuff from the years. So like, when do you think that that, that transition starts? I mean, we're like seeing asset prices go up right now because of all the money printing, but at some point it will pull back. And when it starts to pull back, it's gonna get ugly when there's an, when the unwinding starts to happen. And at that point you're stuck. <laughs> so if it, pull, it, if it pulls back, if it keeps pulling back, what I, would, what I would say is it can't pull back. It has to keep rising forever and it's going to be taken from you in a different format. Taxes, because yeah. uh, but ta but taxes can't do the job but but imagine populism and everything else what they will do with those assets um in in time yeah and for the wealthy it, yeah. and, it, and, and so the only way it could pull back and is is if everything collapsed by 90 percent and you have very quickly and everything everything failed and then yeah. re, re, restart that is a deflationary depression it could happen i would say it's a, a small probability but it could happen and for that to happen governments would have to stop printing and as long as they keep printing they'll just accelerate the speed of the printing to keep up and keep the thing they're, they're going to keep going which accelerates the negative externalities all around the world right it accelerates populism it accelerates all of these things so does that mean if you're wealthy you have no urgency because you know that the government's on your side to keep pumping your asset value over time if you can't see the signposts around what's happening uh, uh to to your wealth going up at the cost of other people mm -hmm. if you can't see that you got to look in the mirror <laughs> and there's a lot of people who can't see it by the way a lot of even i would say my very wealthy friends they're blind to it they can't yeah. see it um they, they don't want to see it they don't want to see this uh, the system that uh, that is driving this injustice they want it's easier to believe how smart they are and how and how their house uh, their rental houses keep going up in value and, and they can sit on a beach and and collect uh, uh, collect tons of rents that keep going up. It's easier to believe that. Blackstone, BlackRock comes into the market and competes with buyers right. for housing. It's incredible. And and so it's way easier to believe that um, 
I'm entitled to this because I'm so smart. Um, and then, then wait, what does the other side look, uh, the coin look like for everybody else? That belief is actually what creates the, that, that wealth being stolen from you or being taken in a different way. And so, uh, so, so I, what I would say is the allocation should be increasing to Bitcoin in that, uh, as a result. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here, but there was a couple of Twitter questions and I think we answered some of them actually just naturally through the discussion. Yeah. And we'd love to get some of these in here. It's just through a couple I thought were interesting. Um, this guy, uh, big hodl number one uh, on Twitter. So it's not American hodl, but it's another hodl. <laughs> uh, hey Jay, uh, can you ask Jeff Booth what assets he recommends other than Bitcoin? And I know he has real estate and some stocks, but what does he recommend for young investors? He must be a young kid. Um, that over the next 20 years in his current environment. So I guess he, and, and is he hundred percent Bitcoin? You don't need to answer that part because that's allocation and stuff. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not hundred percent Bitcoin, but I can answer this in the, the, the question. And Jay, I think you're probably here too. What I do most of, most of what I do is actually technology companies. Yep. And those technology companies, it, 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 yeah, if you, if you saw whether I'm on the board of, a, of the company or, um, uh, or an investor of, I don't think I'd, put all the investments I, I make on my website, but some of the boards I'm on, I, I, I do. Um, I wouldn't be on some of those unless there was an asymmetric bet. Yep. I wouldn't use my time there, but, but there's some, there's some companies, there's technology companies that are creating massive value network effect, uh, a, a, asymmetric bet. Some are early, some will go to zero. Some, will, so, uh, one of them, one of them recently had it, um, 8,000 times return. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so so it makes the overall about, portfolio I, look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You don't. You could get some wrong to be able to. I get a lot wrong, but you only need a few winners. <laughs> when you're good at that job, and being able to see what works and be able to construct portfolios, not just works from that, but but how how people work into that system and everything else, um, you're going to increase your odds. So I do I do a lot of that. Not, um, but I do it actually more more than the money making. It's I like do reciprocity, it in a way. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, exactly. And, and I love, I love that trying to figure out what yep. the, this thing, how to how to how to make that product market fit. And go. I was talking to one of my portfolio founder guys yesterday, one of the companies last night. It's like yeah, so excited, like it's like I feel like it's, I'm in the mix again for like 20 minutes. You know, <laughs> it, it's awesome. Yeah, and so if you don't have access to some some of those. What I'd say, reach out to me separately. Um, I I've even been thinking, should I should I put some of the th like things like a syndicate? That I, 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 I'm not going to do a syndicate. I would never because I, I don't want to run the syndicate. But what I would do is because but what I would do is introduce different founders to different people that were interested, and they could make up their own decision. Sure, I like that. Uh, corn for dogs at corn for dogs asked. <laughs> I love these names. Uh, if you could write one more chapter in your book, what would you say that you haven't already said? Um, and have you orange? How do you orange pill a teenager? He said. And what's your favorite way to spend your time? I, I was the first question of his three questions. I thought was great because it's been a year and a half, a little bit over a year and a half since you published the book. I think uh, you wrote it in 2019, but then you lock it in, and things change. And so, is there anything you would add to the book? So, um, in retrospect, no, but uh, but. And, and the reason I would say no is, is there's so much in the book that is, that is a change of people's minds. Like there's a new mental model mm -hmm. that's hard to grasp. But if, if I said what the chapter that the, this conversation that we're starting to have, where this goes, what it looks like on the other side is, is what I'd love to start talking about more and more and more. I don't know if I, I'll probably not write another book, but if I, if I were to write another chapter and that chapter didn't, because trying to go through all of this, a lot of people read the book and then they go back and read it again right away because there, there's, because it's a change in mental model and, and, and it takes time to be able to start doing that. Um, I don't know if another chapter talking about what the future would look like would have fit onto that because it just might've been too much. But if, if I, if I, if you pressed me for what would I've uh, done, I might've not left it hanging where I did. I might've added the, expanded a little bit where, where, where this goes. Which is probably why I had the one question about the, the, the very end there. Um, yeah. I was going to go with one more, but I'm going to ask a question of my own. So earlier in there, you say, I like taking complex problems and make them simple so that I can explain to a five-year-old. I have a five-year-old. How would you explain Bitcoin to my five-year-old? 
Um, I, I, I would explain it as uh, a technology solution that that takes money printing out of people's hands and, and allows the free market to work. Um, and, and if I simplified it, so, and, and, and the free market would mean we could all live with abundance, that the prices would keep coming down and we wouldn't have to chase higher and higher, higher, uh, higher prices all, all the time. It would, uh, you would increase your time. You just say, listen, if we had Bitcoin as a money, instead of the dollars that you say, all the toys you see, they'd be cheaper and cheaper every year. You can get more of them. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> the five-year-old would like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's in on Bitcoin now. <laughs> uh, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show today, sharing your, your book and uh, all the ideas behind it, your background, your early years. I truly, truly, truly enjoyed the conversation today. Um, everybody, there you have it. Jeff Booth, the author of The Price of Tomorrow. Thanks, Jeff. It's awesome, Jay. Thanks. Thanks.